hey, when in 2006 the J10 was officially declassified and pictures started circulating around the world, well, nobody was really surprised. Western intelligence services had known for about two decades that the Chinese were up to something, and in the end they had a pretty good picture of what the Chinese were up to. Actually, it was what happened between 2007 and 2016 that was unexpected. Welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology and please stay with me till the end because the stuff that we discuss here is quite difficult to find anywhere else on YouTube. The J-10 is currently one of the staples of the Chinese air power. About 500 units are estimated to be in service right now, more than any other model, even counting all the flanker variants altogether. The translation of the Chinese name is Vigorous Dragon, which actually sounds like a male performance enhancer, so I actually prefer the NATO moniker, which is Firebird. The program started in 1988, the first flight was in 1998, and the aircraft reached the initial operational capability in 2006. The development time hasn't been exceedingly long, to be honest, but there have been many hiccups along the way because this was the first time that the Chinese were trying to design something modern entirely in-house. Some believe still to this day that the aircraft is actually a variant of the aborted Israeli Lavi fighter. But this is quite far from the truth. Yes, it's true the two aircraft share the same general configurations, but one of the purposes of the J-10 program was to develop the know-how to produce a modern four-generation aircraft in China. To do this, the Chinese had to acquire or consolidate some technologies that weren't really developed at the time, so they work with Israel and Russia for this purpose. What actually happened was something pretty common, that is a technology transfer. They didn't just redevelop an already existing project. And by the way, speaking of copying aircraft, happens quite often. Uh, if two aircraft share some similarities, share the same general configuration, some observers tend to reach the conclusion that the younger is a sort of a copy of the older, or at least it has been inspired by the older. First thing, considering the timelines required to develop a combat aircraft, there probably should be at least 5 to 10 years between the two projects uh, for the technologies and the design of the older becoming available to the newer. Coping is really useful if you can really avoid doing a chunk of development. If the shape and size of the aircraft is different, then the aerodynamic design cannot be copied. Moreover, the airfoil is probably the most critical part of the design and it is really, really difficult to copy just looking at pictures. If the overall shape and structure is different, then even the structural design cannot be reused. If the engine is different, then there are structural implications and also a lot of internals need to be redesigned, hydraulics, electrics, air ducts, and so on. If the avionics is different, then you need to redesign antenna housing, the internal layout of the avionic base, uh, the electrics, the connections. If the weapons are different, this is even more redesign, and this is a big one. Either you copy almost everything, or you copy an isolated subsystem, otherwise coping is not worth it. Moreover, the world is full of clever and well-educated people that can find their way through this kind of project with just some help. Some people seem to think that you can find competent people just in a few places around the world, but that's actually not true. There are clever people all around the world, there's no divine right to technological superiority. J-10 is a single-engine, single-seater Delta Canard. 
This configuration is typical of the contemporary non-stealth projects. We have already discussed this configuration many times on the channel and there are several videos available if you want to dive deep into this subject. For now, it is enough to say that this kind of configuration has a performance sweet spot exactly at the speeds where most of the military and combat operations are conducted today, between 0.7 and 1.2 Mach. The J-10 is also an unstable design like all the fighters of its generation. It has close coupled canards like many fighters of its generation, the construction is a mix of aluminum, titanium and composites, like all the fighters of its generation. While overall is a pretty unremarkable design, it's very similar to all the other fighters of the fourth generation which are not designed to be stealth. Put the J-10, the Rafale, the Eurofighter, the Gripen and the Lavi side by side in a picture and you have a family picture. However, there are a couple of speculation that we can do about the aircraft just looking at its general layout. The wing has a variable anhedral angle and also pretty large fairing with the fuselage and the internal part uh, seems to be quite thick. It is a rather unusual choice and it is not entirely clear why this complication was adopted. It may remind some inverted gull configuration of old, but those were justified by ground clearance mostly and the J-10 doesn't seem to have any particular problem in this department. It could be a way of actually controlling the point where the delta wing vortices form on the upper surface of the wing, but we definitely can't be certain. Another curious element is the presence of two canted surfaces below the tail. These are fixed uh, surfaces with a superficial similarity with those mounted on the F-16. Their presence seems to suggest some problems with the lateral stability at high angles of attack. I actually have the impression that the vertical stabilizers is a little bit smaller than the other designs, but again the reason why there was this split in three of the vertical surfaces uh, it's difficult to say. So apart a couple of curious choices, the aircraft is uh, pretty unremarkable or if you want it is as remarkable as the other Euro canards are. Well, judge for yourself. <laughs> what was not conventional and definitely remarkable though was what happened between 2007 and 2016. The initial variant, the J-10A, was designed having the European Delta Canards in mind not to copy them, but because it was supposed to have the same performances and the same technology level of those aircraft. So the J-10 came with the four panoramic displays in the cockpit, handsome throttle F-Stix commands and a panoramic head-up display. It was fitted with a Russian engine and with an air intake with a mobile ramp and even the radar was a mechanically scanned Russian radar. And when it entered service, the pilots loved it, and it was quickly clear that it was not even close to the other European designs. Well, to be honest, the Chinese have been aware of the problem for a few years, because the design of the B variant actually started even before the A variant was being produced. The J-10B received an improved and uprated AL-31 engine, fed by, this time, a DSI intake. Probably the similarity with 
the intakes of the F-35 is one of the biggest sources of the, the Chinese can only copy memes. The SI intakes are nothing new. They have been invented in the mid 50s by an Italian, Antonio Ferri, and they make sense now for combat aircraft applications because speed is no longer as important as it used to be in the 60s or the 70s. The SI intakes have a performance sweet spot at low supersonic speed and they are simpler, lighter, cheaper and a bit more stealthy than conventional air intakes. I have an entire video dedicated to the SI intakes and if you are interested in this subject you can watch it on the channel. But the improvements with the J10B didn't stop there. The entire fire control system was rebuilt around an indigenous PESA radar and a new infrared search and track. One way to recognize a J-10B is because the Radum is different from the J-10A, which was necessary to house the new antenna, and it also doesn't have the pitot tube at the tip. In this B version, it is clearly visible the tilting of the antenna upwards, which is a feature common to various fixed antenna implementations. In this way, the antenna's radar reflection is pointed away from the emitter, with the effect of reducing the frontal RCS of the aircraft. It is little known, but radar antennas are a very, very good radar reflector for the same reason that they are a very, very good radar emitter. And they are impossible to hide behind, for example, a layer of radar absorbing materials because otherwise, well, they simply wouldn't work. But we're not over yet because on the tail of the aircraft, the sensors, housings and antenna actually proliferated, showing the presence of a relatively complex and probably integrated electronic warfare suite where the J10A just had a radar warning receiver. And finally, a missile approach warning system was installed, uh, making the aircraft more survivable. And uh, I was forgetting all these systems were indigenous systems developed in China, probably with some external assistance, but they have been developed in China. And in fact, since they have been built in house, we know very little about them. It is not clear when the J-10 reached the initial operating capability, but this should have happened around 2010. But this is not the end, because in 2016 or 2017, the J-10C, a new variant, actually reached its initial operational capability. So the J-10C is the current 2022 production version and it is becoming mainstream. It features an indigenous WS-10 engine, an indigenous AISA radar, and an indigenous helmet mounted sight. And the new antennas have been spotted and the old ones have been rearranged, uh, hinting to some improvements in the electronic warfare area too. So in 10 years, the J-10 went from being a pretty ordinary four generation aircraft to becoming a modern four uh, plus plus generation combat aircraft, uh, ticking pretty much all the boxes, the development underwent by the platform is definitely remarkable and I don't think I can find any other example of so much being developed in so little time. Now. There are three main variants of the J-10, the A, the B and the C, and the C being the current variant. All of them with increasing level of technology and systems. The difference between A and B is massive, it includes a new engine and a new DSI intake. The difference between B and C is limited, but the C version includes a Chinese engine built in China rather than a Russian engine. Between A, B and C, however, there is a massive difference in electronics and warfare systems. Actually, upgrading the A's to the B level seems probably not possible, but it is in principle possible to upgrade the B to the C variant, at least partially, at least for the systems. 
There are also several minor variants. For example, there is a J10A display variant, which is used by the Chinese National Aerobatics Team as an airshow aircraft. There is a naval variant of the J10A, which is the J10AH, which is not carrier capable, but is used by the uh, Chinese Navy. The only difference with the J10A seems to be anti-corrosion treatment and the capability of using some naval weapons. The J-10S and the J-10SH are dual seaters, normally used for training, but they do retain all their combat capabilities. Then we had the J-10B TV seed, which was used to test and experiment with thrust vectoring. And finally, there is a J-10CE variant of the J-10 designed for export. We have very few official numbers about the J-10 and the sources are pretty much all over the place. An interesting point though is that B and C version seem to be longer, larger and taller than the A version and you wouldn't say that by just looking at the pictures. Actually B and C seem a bit shorter. Making sense of the engine versions is complicated. All the sources differ slightly with what happened with the propulsion. If I understand correctly, both the B and C variants can be propelled both by the Chinese WS-10 or the Russian Saturn AL-31 FN, but the aircraft currently in production use the WS-10. To be honest, there are both engines in the class of 90 kN dry, 140 kN with afterburner, so the difference in performance, while noticeable, is probably not substantial. Anyway, for those who are passionate about these things, here is a summary of all the specifications. Well, it's difficult to have this kind of information, even for Western aircraft, even for the commissioned aircraft. You can imagine how easy it is with Chinese aircraft. So the J-10C main sensor is the KLJ-7A AISA radar. So apologies, there is a bad mistake in the second episode of the series dedicated to the J-10. I say that the radar used by the J-10 is the KLJ-7A, which is wrong. That is the radar which is actually installed on the JF-17 block. The AISA radar installed on the J10C is not yet disclosed, but it should be a larger unit, obviously, with an antenna of about 60 cm diameter and about 1200 elements. It is possible that the two units are not much different because they share a common heritage, but definitely in the video I was wrong. It is uncertain if the radar has LPI features, but honestly it would be wasted if it didn't, so... Well, so I understand that probably needs explaining what is an LPI radar. A normal radar has a relatively regular scan pattern with the antenna moving irregularly from one side to another or moving circularly and it has usually just one beam. LPI radar you can have more beams, irregular emissions, different pulse repetition frequencies, you can also hop between frequencies while you are emitting and also you can use different and varied waveforms. All these features make difficult for a sensor to recognize those emissions as the emissions of a radar. The maximum radar power is not declared, but it is to be seen if the electrical power availability on the J-10 is sufficient to use the radar to the max. The aircraft was originally designed with a different radar and different systems, and we don't know if the electrical power available on board could grow adequately. Actually, I'm mentioning this because the availability of electrical power is probably the main factor that is limiting the upgrade of combat aircraft. However, like every modern fighter, J-10B and J-10C are actually equipped 
with an infrared search and track which is mounted in the classical position in front of the cockpit and above the radar. Very little is known about this unit. What we have is a reported detection range of 40 kilometers for an aircraft approaching the J-10 and 100 kilometers from the rear aspect. However, all these numbers related to the distances, performances, number of aircraft that can be tracked and so on must always be taken with a truckload of salt because a pinch is probably not enough. I have zero doubt that these numbers are not accurate and even the western ones they're generally not accurate and they are not for two reasons. The first is we don't know all the details on how these performances are actually calculated. Second, everybody has an incentive to this information. So, I leave the judgment to you. There are several other systems of the J-10, but the connections between these systems are a bit peculiar. In fact, the J-10 uses a standard ARINC 429 data bus. A data bus is the equivalent of a local area network. It is the equivalent of those cables that you plug into your computer when you are not using Wi-Fi. Peculiarity in this case is that the ARINC 429 is not a Chinese standard. It is an international standard and it is a civilian standard. It is used on civilian aircraft. In the West, the de facto standard for military data buses is the MIL STD 1553, but you can't expect the Chinese or the Russians to use it. What is a bit surprising though it is that the Chinese military is relying on a civilian standard. It would be understandable if there were foreign weapons and systems using this standard, but if they exist are actually few and far between. I personally never heard of one. If you know any better about the use of the ARINC 429, well, the comment section below is open to everyone, so please let me know. The data bus connects several systems on the aircraft. The aircraft features an air data computer, a quadruplex fly-by-wire system, a mission management computer, and a GPS INS navigation unit that we know nothing about. These computers drive three multifunctional displays in the cockpit, plus a panoramic head-up displays, plus a helmet-mounted sight. The radar warning receiver is named ARW9101. A. It works from S to Q band, it features four antennas, and the threat library to identify radar emitters is a national Chinese library. This system is believed to be integrated with the chaffs and flares dispensers uh, to create an automated protection suite. And to add to the protection of the J-10B and C, a missile approach warning system has been installed, making the aircraft more survivable. The aircraft is observed equipped with an IFF whose antenna is visible behind the cockpit, at least we think. On the J-10C there is another blade antenna behind the IFF antenna and analysts believe it is used by a data link to guide the PL-15 air-to-air missile. However, this is speculation and we can't really be sure. And speaking of data links, I didn't find any reference to the type of data links that are installed on the aircraft because it would be very strange if it had none. The Chinese have developed their own high-speed data link which is called the DTS-03 with a capability of about 2 megabit per second and a range of about 400 kilometers. They also received the Russian data links when they received the flankers so I would expect that one or both of these types to be actually available on board the J-10. Around the tail of the aircraft there are a few antennas that have been identified probably as VOR uh, slash localizer antennas, but probably there is more going on there. In fact there are some features on the tail that make us think that they, they are electronics housings. For example we know nothing about an electronic countermeasure suite on board the aircraft. The J-10A used to be seen with an ECM pod, the J-10B and C less so unless we are talking a configuration for suppression of air defenses. Considering the importance 
that in recent times the Chinese are giving to electronic warfare, it really seems likely that the aircraft has some form of jammers on board. So as you can see there is a lot of speculation about what is going on and the analysts have to work with the news that filter in the press or the pictures that are available on the internet. Unfortunately, I'm old enough to remember when, during the Cold War, this kind of speculations were a constant buzz in the specialized press. So, since the J-10 is expected to cover a multi-role spot, it has been integrated with several Chinese weapons. Overall, it has a rather complete panoply of weapons available either air-to-air -air or air-to-ground. However, we have to consider that the Chinese still use a good percentage of unguided weapons, like the Russians, of which the aircraft can carry about 5600 kilos. But I'm running ahead of me. Let's start from the beginning. The J-10 features a classic gun. It uses a Gryazov Shipunov GSH-23 dual-barrel Russian cannon, a model that is in use on several aircraft, mainly of Russian or Chinese origin, around the world. It is a 23mm weapon with a rate of fire of about 3,400 rounds per second and a muzzle velocity of 715 meters per second. And no, the dual barrel configuration is not just an additional barrel, it's a specific technology. In fact, the recoil of one barrel actually chambers the other barrel and sets it ready for fire. The weapon doesn't need any electrical actuation to start the firing cycle. It is entirely mechanical and very, very reliable. It's true, it has half the rate of the American Gatlings, but it starts the firing cycle faster. The round is heavier and with more exploding mass. This cannon is not new at all. It was designed in the 60s, but it is still in use. We have to say that the fuse of the rounds that were fired by the first series of the weapon were not really uh, reliable, but that problem is long gone. Chinese air-to-air -air weapons in these days are quite famous and quite widely covered, but still, we want to give our take. And mind, we are using the J10C, the most recent variant, as our reference variant. So the C variant is integrated with the PL-8 and the PL-10 short-range infrared missiles. The PL-8 is basically the standard Chinese air-to-air -air weapon. It has been in service since 1988 and it is a derivation of the Israeli Python. The PL-10 is an entirely Chinese weapon. It is not clear when it enters service, but it seems to be a great improvement upon the PL-8. It is slightly larger than the PL-8. It features a mix of thrust vectoring and aerodynamic controls, allowing the weapon to pull a very high Gs. And the seeker is an infrared imaging seeker that is actually capable of swinging plus or minus 90 degrees. Uh, that is, the entire frontal hemisphere is covered by this sensor. The sensor is slave to the helmet-mounted sight, and so the pilot can designate a target just by looking at it. The maximum range is declared to be 20 kilometers. Coming to medium range, the aircraft is integrated with the PL-12 Active Radar Homing Missile. This is basically the standard medium range air-to-air weapon for the Chinese Air Force and the Chinese Navy. Analysts consider it to be perfectly equivalent to the American AMRAAM or the Russian R-77. As often happens with Chinese creations, we know very little about this weapon. We know it uses the same data link as the R-77. R-77, we know that a particular care has been placed on the home jam modes and the maximum range is declared to be about 100 kilometers. Uh, 
mind when we talk about missile ranges we should always exert caution because the declared range is usually the maximum ballistic range for the missile and even that may not also be true the actual distance at which a missile can reach a target is extremely variable. It depends from the relative speeds between the launcher and the target and also extremely important is the relative direction between the two. If they are approaching head-on the missile range is actually maximized but if one is chasing the other the range could be easily 10%, 15% of the maximum declared range. So don't take these numbers too seriously. It entered service around 2005 and since then it has been seen basically on all the main Chinese platforms. In 2016 though, a new weapon appeared on the pictures being leaked from behind the Great Firewall. The PL-15 is a bigger weapon than the PL-12, albeit the general configuration and the guidance systems are similar. The analysts believe that the size is actually an indication of a very long range. Some sources actually estimate that the ballistic range in ideal condition could reach 300 kilometers. That would make the PL-15 the longest range weapon in service today. The weapon features an AESA radar and a dual thrust rocket motor and Western analysts believe that it has been developed mainly to attack high value assets like OAX or tankers. Should I say OAXs? Chinese air-to-ground weaponry is less known but is definitely worth consideration. So air-to-air -air is an area where China is believed to have reached substantial parity with the West, but air-to-ground weaponry is less known. So as we said before, the aircraft is still often seen with iron bombs and unguided rockets. The latter in particular seem to be object of quite a lot of attention during training. We have to remember that the Air Force in China is actually a branch of the army. Till the end of the 20th century, air-to-air -air was sort of an afterthought, or well, maybe it was definitely given less consideration than air-to-ground. Missions like close air support or ground attack were considered the real priority. So a lot of attention was given and is still given to the, those kind of weapons that can deliver a large amount of firepower on the ground. And in the case of China, for a large amount, we are probably still talking about low technology slash unguided. However, this is changing in China too. So the Chinese have created a series of families of weapons that fill similar roles as Western weapons. Okay, let's start. One of the most common Chinese guided weapons are the bomb kits of the LTPGB family. These systems have a close resemblance with the American Paveway. In fact, the first generation was derived by captured Paveway 1 laser designation pods captured by the Vietnamese during the Vietnam War. The first generation was actually a cheap copy and was not considered adequate, so it never entered service. But the following generation, the LT2, actually did enter service because it was a cheap, reliable and effective weapon that is still in use today. And it is probably the most common of all the Chinese guided weapons. There is a third generation, which is the LT3, which is not a copy, but is definitely similar in design to the American Paveway 3, but is seen in smaller numbers because apparently it is more expensive and complex than the simple LT2. Together with the laser-guided LT family, I think you will not be surprised to learn that exists a 
Inertial and GPS guided family, the FT family, that is sort of equivalent to the American J Dams. There is a legend on the internet that even this one was actually copied uh, from the J Dam, but no, the inertial technology and the GPS technology are pretty much commonplace. They can be easily derived from civilian applications, so there was no need to copy a different weapon just to develop this. Having this kind of guidance is just a good idea and it was within reach of a number of countries. For example, France has a similar family of weapons. It is quite ironic that the weapon can use obviously the Chinese Beidou system, but also the American GPS and the Russian GLONASS. Yes, because the casual observer may not know that the most used uh, positioning system in the world is not the American GPS, there are at least three others. There is the European Galileo, which is actually a civilian service, the Russian GLONASS, and the Chinese Beidou, which is considered to be the most precise. The Beidou system had sort of a rough start. The Chinese had to go through three iterations, but in 2020, the constellation of 55 satellites has been completed, and the pretty much the whole of the globe is now covered by this system. I wouldn't be surprised if the phone that I'm using to record this is actually calculating its position using Beidou rather than GPS. And for those who are surprised that a weapon can use more than one system, even potentially opponent systems, well, this is a technology that is commonplace. Most civilian receivers use more than one system. More modern than LT and FT families, there is the LS family. And in particular, the aircraft has been seen with the LS-6 gliding bomb. So the LS-6 is basically just another family of kits that can be installed on an iron bomb. It comes as a normal kit or as a gliding kit. And the gliding kit is such that with an ideal release at high speed and high altitude, it can reach above 60 kilometers of distance, which makes the weapon sort of a standoff weapon. The peculiarity of the LS family is that it combines the LT and FT guidance systems in just one package. So it can be laser guided, it can use the inertial guidance, or it can use a positioning system to direct itself toward the target. Obviously the advantage is that the weapon can attack either moving targets or fixed targets in the first case, it will require laser designation and guidance. In the second case, it will use the inertial guidance or GPS. Apparently, they're also developing an infrared guided version, so they're investing big time on this family. The KD-88 is generally considered an equivalent of the American SLAM, but in pure Russian style it is more a family of systems. Yes, the Chinese definitely appear to be quite fond of this concept of a family of systems. The missile uses a small turbofan engine and it has a range that is estimated to be about 230 kilometers. The total weight is 670 kilos with a warhead of about 285 kilos, a semi-armor piercing, which is respectable. In the KD-88 family, there are two versions currently in service, one with television guidance and the other with infrared guidance. When the missile is launched, it uses inertial guidance, but it also has a data link that can be used for mid-course correction, but it also transmits back to the launching aircraft the images that are captured by the sensor. Terminal guidance can be completely automatic according to the parameters set before the launch, or it can still be executed by a human, which can choose the target at the very last second, 
giving the weapon a um, good flexibility. However, a drawback of this missile is the fact that the launching aircraft must carry a relatively bulky external communications pod guide the weapon. The J-10 has been seen carrying two KD-88. And since the Chinese have this concept of weapon families, uh, there are news of a radar guided variant and suppression of, of our defense variants, so a radar homing variant currently in development. The YJ-91 is another typical Chinese story, because at first sight it may seem another copy of a Russian weapon, the K KH-31, but in truth it is not. Yes, the KH-31 is produced in China under an official license. The YJ-91 features substantial differences. In fact, the Chinese use it as a radar homing missile with a range of about 100 km and a speed of Mach 3. It weighs 600 kilos with an 87 kilos warhead. So while general design, structures and propulsion are pretty much the same as the KH-31, the seeker and the warhead are totally different. First of all, it is one seeker and not several seekers as in the original KH-31, but still it has a multi-band capability, so it's capable of addressing several types of different radars. Well, I realize that addressing in this case is sort of a euphemism. The YJ-91 is less dependent than the original KH-31 to the aircraft ECM because with this seeker it can detect and designate its own targets. From the same missile, the Chinese then developed in-house an anti-ship version. This version seems to be capable of terminal randomized maneuvering and considering that the speed of the weapon is about Mach 3, a missile like this is more than a match for many point defense systems. So as you can see in terms of armament and weaponry, the J-10C seems to be perfectly aligned with other fighters of its own generation. And if you want to understand which are these other fighters that the J-10 is up against, I would suggest you to watch part one of this series that is going to appear beside me, together with some other interesting videos about China and the Chinese Air Force. So, thank you very much for watching and see you there.